Okay, hey guys, uh, welcome back. So today we're going to cover the period 1750s and 1900s, and we're going to start off with the Enlightenment. So the Enlightenment is actually the precursor to almost everything that's going to follow after this. So it's really important that we understand this. So what was the Enlightenment? So the Enlightenment was a period of time where people started to challenge the pre-existing conditions that exist in society. So asking why is he king and why am I in my social standards, why do I follow this religion, why does the world work this way, etc. Empiricism is um, the idea that the world can be seen through our senses and people started to believe this. Instead of, that, uh, instead of learning about our world through religious texts, we actually go and explore and learn and uh, test. Uh, John Locke was a practicer of empiricism. He believed that humans have natural rights. Uh, those rights include life, liberty, and property. As you can see, that's really similar to um, our, Const our Declaration of Independence, which states that each human has the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Developed, he developed a social contract, which basically means that the government protects the people, and in return the people give up some rights. The government is made for the people, not the other way around. Um, this is also represented in our Declaration of Independence. The rise of nationalism. So people started becoming loyal to their nation, to a common religion, to a common culture, instead of just a king or queen. Also, Adam Smith, he posted, or yeah, he posted, he created, he wrote the book Wealth of Nations, and in this book he represented the idea of laissez-faire, of no government control on business, that business can be run completely independent from government intervention and the economy would run fine. Deism is a new type of is a new form of religion that came on, which basically believes that God does not play an active role in life, only created the world and then lets the actions roll independently. Also humans started to use their senses to explore natural laws and to understand and get closer to God. Finally women started fighting for rights in uh, Mary Wallencraft's Idea. She wrote the Vindication of Women's Rights and the Declaration of Sentiments stated that stated women's equality, and it was written at the Seneca Falls Convention. Lastly, slaves and serfs in Europe and Russia, along with abolitionist forces, led to the abolition of slavery and serfdom. Okay, so a lot of revolutions occurred in this period. These were called the Atlantic Revolutions. Each were uh, influenced by Atlantic by um, enlightenment thinking in some way and each were um, based on or influenced by the last so the f four we're going to look at is the american haitian latin american and french revolution the american revolution was caused by lack of representation in parliament and increased taxation um, the declaration of independence that we wrote shares much of john locke's key concepts of unalienable rights and popular sovereignty. The result of this revolution was that the Americans actually won over Britain due to this vast distance and we knew the land better. Also the British fought um, in bright red clothes and very um, apparent while the Americans fought in forests with um, camouflage and etc. The French Revolution was the next one. It was inspired by the American Revolution. The third estate, commoners, sh uh, shared one third of the vote, while the clergy and the nobility shared the other two thirds. They felt underrepresented, especially because they represent 98% of the population. They split off from the other estates and they rose up against their king. They were successful in this manner by creating a limited monarchy. However, right after this period, the reign of terror began in which many government officials were executed by Maximilian Robosphere, who was later executed as well for his um, harshness. In the midst of the French Revolution, the Haitian Revolution forms. This was the first successful slave revolution. It, w it was when Haitian slaves actually uprose against their slave owners and won. They killed and hanged many of the slave owners, and they established their own free government in which uh, Africans were equal to um, Europeans. Finally, the Latin American Revolution. This was a revolution where the Creoles, native-born Spanish, rose up against the Peninsulares, which were Spain-born Spanish, due to economic political injustices. The Creoles wanted um, the same trade rights and um, basically ability to make money as the Peninsulares. This uprising didn't really help the lower classes as much because they still received the same harsh treatment 
as they did before. Okay, so now let's talk about industrialization. Industrialization is another big factor that comes into play here. Um, so where did industrialization, industrialization begin? Well, it began in England. So the industrialization, industrial revolution begins in England due to multiple water bodies. So it had multiple rivers to, to energize its productions, lots of raw materials underneath its surface. There's new agricultural methods that came up along with its increased population growth and urbanization or people moving to the cities. It also created factories to produce great amounts of good. And that factory system that we'll get to later had many innovations that allowed it to produce mass goods. So, industrialization then spread to the rest of Europe because Europe had the similar conditions and their, prox their proximity to England. Next, it moved to the USA. Mass migrations of immigrants from Europe, Asia, Australia, all led to an increase in factory labor. These factory, factory owners were then able to pay lower wages to these immigrants and had little, little concern for their safety. They were seen as replaceable. Also, the Americans did not like the idea that immigrants were not taking jobs from them. Then it spread to Russia. Russia built the Trans-Siberian Railroad. Um, this railroad allowed for increased communication as a stretch and transportation as it stretched from Moscow all the way to the east. Also, this industrialization was largely state-sponsored. So unlike England, it wasn't the investors and the businessmen who were creating these. It was actually the Russian government. Finally, Russia became the world's fourth largest steel producer at this time. Next, we go to Japan. Now, there's a dotted line stretching from England to Japan. There is a reason for this. Japan actually selectively adopted Western industrialization. They understood that those countries that modernized and industrialized were now becoming the world's major powers. And to protect itself and its rich culture, it must take on some of these properties in order for its um, continuation. So, this was kind of forced on it when the USA brought a fleet of destroyers to Japan's borders and asked, but really forced, Japan to open its borders and trade. Japan's industrialized, Japan industrialized to protect itself from Westerners and their culture. This industrialization was called the Meiji Restoration. They made multiple reforms along with building railroads and factories, and actually became a world power that will later go to imperialize and colonize other places. Now we go to the Ottoman Empire. As you can see, there is no line connecting England to the Ottoman Empire. This is because they did not industrialize or modernize. They were known as the sick man of Europe, as we had said earlier. This is because they were slowly shrinking and declining in power. They had a string of weak, unqualified sultans, which is basically an emperor, and the European powers in the north that were growing stronger were now pressing in inwards to the Ottoman Empire. Then we go to China. China had actually started the self-healing program in China to protect their culture by modernizing. However, this largely failed as it died out. When Japan beat China in the Sino-Japanese Wars, Japan, uh, China started to issue 100 days of reform where it started to industrialize rapidly. China gave all its trade rights to Western powers in return for help in modernization. Now let's look at some uh, properties of this. So in places that were industrialized, Tenements were formed. These were quick, uh, crude structures that people lived in. They were crowded and packed. There's lots of tra trash everywhere, and there was no indoor plumbing, leading to increased spread of diseases. Also, there's a new emerging middle class: the upper uh, business-owning class, the lower factory work class, and the middle class, which which was, which also had the white collars, which worked in office jobs and um, nine-to-five jobs. Finally, there's a new idea of the cult of domesticity, which basically um, the idea that a woman's role to, is to create a home as a safe haven. Obviously, this was wrong, and later on, uh, many women would stand up to prove that uh, they can do the same thing as a man can. Finally, an increase in smog and water pollution was common within all these regions. Finally, new capitalist ideas formed, such as there should be no government intervention, the joint stock economy or companies where people can willingly invest. They also had limited liabilities, meaning they cannot lose. They do not share in the company's debts. They only share in their profits, and they can only lose the amount of money they have invested. Finally, there's multinational corporations which formed. These corporations span multiple nations, allowing them to make lots and lots of money. 
Also, a new leisure culture formed. In this culture, people would pay money for leisure activities, such as um, us going to a movie theater. But <laughs> they didn't have movie theaters. Some new inventions that occurred during this time was the water frame. The water frame started in England, and as I said earlier, this water frame this allowed factories to be built near rivers, and the energy from the factory would come from the movement of water. The spinning jenny was a, a invention in textile production. It was usually hooked up to a water frame and allowed for people to build textiles rapidly. Finally, the idea of interchangeable parts by Eli Whitney was created. Uh, basically, they could separate the production of one item into multiple smaller items, and if one were to break, it would be easy to replace them again. This would actually lead later on to Henry Ford's idea of the assembly line. Finally, steam engines were then created. This allowed factories to build anywhere. It uh, doesn't need a river to power it, they can use steam power. Using this idea, steam engine trains and even the first steam locomotive were creative, created. Steam trains allowed for transportation to vary across the state. Steam locomotives did not really pick up. Finally, oil pumps and refineries, they started creating steel production. Also, increasing communications also the, te the known as the telegraph, was built across the United States, allowing for us to communicate and send messages across long distances, and this later led to Alexander Graham Bell's um, invention of the telephone. Finally, there was increase in migration trade worldwide. Labor unions started to form. These labor unions would um, work and protest towards reform. They actually achieved a lot of stuff. They achieved the five-day work week, minimum wage, the right to vote, and um, no ch child labor laws. However, due to all of the injustices caused by a pure capitalist society, new economic theories like Karl Marx's socialism in the Communist Me Manifesto outline these flaws and try to ex give a solution. Karl Marx believed that the bourgeoisie or the upper class was getting richer and richer based on the backs of the commoners or the lower classes. Finally, the last part of 1750s to 1900s is the imperialism in the state. There were three major countries that were involved in this imperialism, Great Britain, France, and Belgium. However, also Spain, Italy, and um, Germany would be involved in this. Imperialism happened in two places, Africa and China, and we'll look at both of these in um, depth. Finally, the Suez Canal was built by the Europeans in order to connect the Mediterranean to the Red Sea. This increased transportation tenfold since now the European powers didn't have to go across Africa to get into the Indian Ocean. And as you'll see, Great Britain will start building colonies right in the Indian Ocean territory. Okay, so let's start with reasons why um, imperialism occurred. Well, imperialism, <laughs> imperialism to start off with is the idea or is countries going out and conquering lands to bring into their own empire then they would use these lands in order to uh, build in order to get more resources get converts etc so they felt like they were meant to spread their culture this is also known as the white man's burden they thought that they as uh, a productive high society have a responsibility to lower societies to give them their culture and teach them the right way of life er air quotes. Um, also the idea of social Darwinism, which basically means that white people were more evolved than those that were not, and again that they are more fit, and those ideas of superiority resonate within European culture. Finally, they wanted to go out and get colonies to, to spread Christianity and find converts, to get glory and respect from other nations, and they wanted more money for their trade routes. They wanted to um, also grab new resources for their countries. So a major effect of imperialism, the major event was a, sc a scramble for Africa. In the scramble for Africa, many of the European nations are looking for a piece of the pie or a piece of Africa to make money and to build their um, glory. So U European nations, uh, Otto von Bismarck, <laughs> von Bismarck hosted the Berlin Conference this was because he knew that in this attempt to grab as much land from Africa as they can, there would be many wars in the European nations. So, in the, at the Berlin Conference, the European nations would split up Africa into a way that everyone would be happy. 
A good example of this imperialism in Africa was the Belgium Congo. So the Belgium Congo was ruled by King Leopold, and he exploited the Congo and made money through kidnapping uh, family members and then forcing the remaining family members to harvest the rubber in exchange for their family members back. This is horrible injustice is done. Uh, it was done to get rubber, and as you know, rubber grows on trees. Eventually, Belgium learned of these injustices and actually took back the Congo from King Leopold. Uh, you don't need to know this, but Ethiopia and Libya were actually the only two uh, nations to actually defend themselves from imperial, imperial encroachment. And then these are just areas that the France, the French, Great Britain, and uh, Germany were able to conquer. Just general areas. And if you would like to know, Spain would actually conquer this area right here. But um, Italy would go on to conquer this area along with this area. And yeah. So now let's talk about the imperial giant, Great Britain. They would go on to conquer India, New Zealand, and Australia. In India, Brit the British took advantage of the Hindu and M Muslim divide and political fracturing ca caused by the previous king of the Mughal Empire, King Arzam Arzangbar. <laughs> anyway, uh, using this, they were able to take up all of India and use it to become extremely wealthy. They also were able to take over New Zealand by kicking out the natives and pushing them to smaller lands. Eventually, the British encroached on these lands, starting the New Zealand Wars. And of course, the British, with their uh, futuristic technology and advancements, won that war. Finally, the British, British used Australia as a penal colony. In this colony, the British would send multiple prisoners there. And, and basically, that's how they would send their prisoners. However, they eventually learned that this area was rich in natural resources and that it had a good climate for agriculture. So they took, they attacked the natives and actually took over the land and people started settling there. Finally, the Hoxha people um, staged a rebellion against the uh, Great Britain and they fought for over 40 years. However, once the cattle started dying, the Hoxha people thought that by killing all of them, they would so they would drive away the British by requesting their ancestry. However, the cattle killing movement, as it was called, led them only to have hunger and eventually lose this rebellion. Okay, so let's talk about China. So in China, it was not the same imperialism as in Africa. In Africa, these European countries would actually take over the area. In China, it was called economic imperialism, where they only control the economy of that nation. So the signing this economic imperialism basically meant that these European nations had complete control over the economy. In the beginning, China would have, um, would actually, Great Britain would import more from China than it did export, meaning that silver was moving towards China. To balance the trade deficit, Great Britain started growing opium in India. This opium was then sent to China to uh, be sold. In China, it gained a lot of ground and actually um, it hooked many people onto it. This this very addictive drug led to more silver moving towards Great Britain as now um, the people were buying opium with silver. China realized this new trade uh, deficit change and tried to crack down and ban um, opium. However, the banning of it caused Great Britain to actually start a war called the Opium Wars. In the first Opium Wars, Great Britain won and opened up three ports to their trade for free trade, also that opium was allowed to be traded. Then the second time, there was a second Opium War in which the Britain, Great Britain opened up five ports and again wanted free trade. This marked the beginning of the signing of unequal treaties, giving Europeans and Japan trading rights in spheres of influence. Of course, once Great Britain proved to the world that any industrial society can beat any unindustrial society, different countries started coming, such as Russia, Japan, and France, and starting carving up their own economic uh, spheres of influence. Japan had a very influential role in this time, too. As I said earlier, they went through the Meiji Restoration. In this restoration, Japan became a dominant power in the world and took over Korea and some of Southeast Asia. They also had their own sphere of influence in China. And finally, we talk about Russia. Russia expanded 
greatly during this time period. And they took over parts of the Ottoman Empire, uh, China, Mongolia, and Manchuria. Manchuria. Okay, there's also a new type of uh, cash crop farming where con countries would be, instead of practicing subsistence farming, which basically they grow whatever they need, they would grow cash crops in order to be sold to a global market. This depleted soil nutrients and made the economy dependent on one crop. If that crop failed that year, so would the economy. Secondly, guano, bird poop, was used as a fertilizer. Due to Great Britain's ever-increasing population, they needed more food production. And due to the lack of nutrients in the soil from cash crop farming, they actually started getting guano into the countries. Lastly, South America started gr growing tons of meat. For and thanks to new technologies in refrigeration, this was shipped to Great Britain for food. <clears throat> Alright, to so the USA. So in US believed in manifest destiny, basically saying that the land that they lived on is theirs by the will of God, and they were meant to expand. So they continue expanding westward, or sorry, yeah, westward, until they reach the um, Pacific Ocean. However, they fo forced the natives in their way to relocate. This mass relocation was called the Trail of Tears, and many Indians died from it. The Cher Cherokee tried to prevent this by assimilating into American culture. However, they were also uh, kicked out of the lands. Finally, this resistance movement that, moved, that sprung up across America was the Ghost Dance, which was basically a dance used to bring ancestors back from the dead and get rid of the white man. And then finally, in the U.S. invested in South and Central America with factories and production and manufacturing to gain viable trade partners, which they did, which they were successful in doing. And lastly, we go to Latin America. In Latin America, Tupac Amaru, a native, led a native rebellion against the Spanish rule by arresting an officer for um, abuses. This uprising was crushed by the Spanish Spain, and then the people were executed. Okay. That is it for now. Thank you so much for watching this playlist, and I hope you do well on your AP test. Please like and subscribe. Have a great day.